Traveling down river in the Niger Delta is a journey into the heart of Nigeria's most intractable problem. For 20 years, this region has been in crisis, with rebel groups holding multinational oil companies and the government to ransom. We are all fighting for the freedom of our people, we are fighting for our resources, we are fighting for our land. It's not long before you see the source of the problem. Everywhere in the Delta are massive platforms like these, which pump billions of dollars worth of oil every year and spew noxious fumes into the air. My traveling companion is Lucky Managila, who has spent the last 10 years fighting for a piece of that fortune. If you go to where these their companies are, if you go to where their staffs live, they are living in heaven Why we are living in hell. Lucky man wants to show me what's fueling his righteous anger. A life of squalor amidst untold oil riches. This is the island he grew up on, near what's known locally as Bile Kingdom. This community lives without electricity or roads and has just one poorly built water pump installed by the local government. What is that this? The water's so it's salty, happening. it's not fit for human consumption. So the islanders have gone back to drinking from the same well they've drawn from for generations. This is the community well. This well has been here for over 30 years. I drank from this well while I was a baby. Nearby is what passes for sanitation on the island. This is the male toilet. The only modern building is this half-finished school, which the oil giant Royal Dutch Shell began building for them, but never finished. As you can see, it's a 10 by 10 room. I don't know where they're going to put the students. And even at that, look at the structure. It has taken them three years to put up what should have been done in three months. Lucky Man says that this is just one of hundreds of broken promises made by governments and oil companies. Ten years ago, his frustration saw him pick up the two main tools of the young militants here. The gun and the mask. The mask remind me of so many things I've done. Like what? Like killing a fellow human being wearing this mask. And don't give a damn about it. He says that the world looks different through the mask. Okay. You look like an enemy now because you're colored. They're white. So many people in your color has been here and has done so many wrong things to us. Locals may live without oil's profits, but they have all of its problems. Gas flaring occurs all over the Delta. It's the cheapest way to dispose of excess gas but it's curtailed elsewhere in the world because of the pollution that it produces. At night, it's the brightest light over cities with no electricity. Then when it rains, the byproducts return to earth with disastrous results. For communities living nearby those facilities, like Ibucha, where I am today, rain like this is incredibly corrosive. 
I'm told that this piece of corrugated iron is only three years old, and yet the acid rain has left it weak as paper. At this hospital, Dr. Abuwan Nian tells me that flaring is causing a rising rate of respiratory infections. We have a pneumonia in children between the age of 5 and 12. Then we have uh, asthmatic problems in other elderly people. Yeah, the normal cough, ordinary cough, are also very, very rampant with Qatar in this zone. I think air pollution contributes so much. Ninety percent of Niger Deltans are unemployed and live on just a few dollars a day, despite the hugely profitable industry nearby. Barnabas Ben has four children, all of them university graduates, and none can find work. The state governments in the Delta are given 13 percent of the national oil revenue, which is supposed to be put directly into villages like Barnabas's. But he says his community has never seen any of that money. What do you think happens to that money? We don't, I don't know. I don't, if, it is, if, it's, if it is being paid, I don't know what goes. It is better to ask Shell whom to whom they send the money, because they are taking the oil. Shell should know the right answer to give. Where do they send that money? I hope everything is okay. I hope you'll be having a good time here in Yenabo. That money is administered by state governors like Timmy Pre Silva. This is his home, the plush governor's residence for Bielsa State. Evidently, the politicians are not being shortchanged. You see uh, some amethyst. That is the name of this stone, I think. But this is something I really like very much. What happens to that money? It's spent on behalf of the people. Whatever expenditure we make here, in developing this capital is on behalf of every Bielsa. And that is what we are doing. We are also at the same time doing work in their various villages, although it's not really very, it's not um, to the uh, extent that it should go. Because we, don't, we are not benefits. Federal government call us fools, call us idiots. We fathers, our children, our brothers, our mothers, we are not benefiting anything. These long-held grievances have radicalized an entire generation of young Nigerians. Today, these militants are staging a rare public show of strength. Through violence, sabotage, and kidnapping, they've drastically reduced Nigeria's oil production. And they've done it using weapons supplied by the government's number one enemy, a man they recently freed from jail, Henry Yoka. Dateline secured a rare interview. The Nigerian government was compelled to release me. They did not uh, release me of their own free will. And so I just feel that, uh, I just feel that at least they understood the strength of the, of the militia groups in Niger Delta and the, and the ability of these groups to shut down the entire Nigerian exports. Oka is a leader of the Movement for the Emancipation of the Niger Delta, or MEND. <laughs> He's determined to keep on fighting. I don't expect my people to just sit down quietly and accept these things, especially when we have the weapons to protect ourselves and our people. This is where the real political power in Nigeria resides, the capital, Abuja. It's an affluent and pristine city built far away from the creeks using the oil royalties that never made it to the Delta. 
The pressure is now on the federal government here to address the grievances over oil production. Major General Godwin Abe is Nigeria's Minister for Defense. He comes from the Delta and doesn't deny that the people there have been shortchanged. Uh, there's no question about that, that these habitations are reasonable, they are not unusual of a people, but it is the style of demanding their rights that has been unacceptable to government. They have a right to express their views, but they don't have the right to kill or to kidnap because they want to express their views. That is barbaric. That is not acceptable. Having failed to protect the oil industry with military might, now the government is offering the rebels an amnesty. As long as they disarm. That is why we are pleading that all the militants who are still hesitant should accept the goodwill of government and indeed the good intentions of Mr. President and surrender their arms in the interest of the ordinary people of Nigeria. Because violence will beget violence. Today, the first militant group to take up the offer is attending a disarmament ceremony. These rebel soldiers are led by the self-styled General Victor Ben, alias Boilov. He arrives to fanfare from the military and political elite. To put aside political differences and come together in pursuit of our common goal in the development of the Niger Delta region. Boilov tells me it's time for the rebels to change their ways. There is time for everything. There is time for play card struggle. There is time for armed struggle. And uh, what we believe now, the time of armed struggle is over. I think uh, we have to go into dialogue because we have to give peace a chance. For years, General Boilov has been men's most respected battlefield tactician and a living nightmare for the oil companies. But now he's placing his faith in the politicians. So I think I will give the government a chance. We are holding them by their words. As I spoke with the president one on one, and uh, with the way it sounds to me, I think uh, the president is willing to do something, but he needs a peaceful atmosphere to operate. This disarmament is the first breakthrough for the government's amnesty gambit, and it has split Mend in two. Rebel leader Henry Oka believes that Boilov is being duped. Well, I think it's a ploy by the government to bring the fight in Niger Delta to an end without addressing the real issues. You know, it's just uh, another attempt to sabotage the, the efforts of the different groups fighting for the freedom of the Niger Delta people. For him to come up this way that uh, we shouldn't allow, we shouldn't uh, accept the amnesty. We see it very bad of him. We are not babies. We are not fools or, you know, we are not fools or anything. Back in Abuja, Major General Abe suspects some people of prolonging the conflict for mercenary motives. There are a number of people who have been benefiting from this state of insecurity. Like Henry Oka. I wouldn't uh, want to mention anybody at this stage. Uh, but certainly, those who are involved in gun running, those who are involved in illegal bunkering, those who are involved in smuggling, these elements are benefiting massively from it. The president's amnesty offer ran till this month. But even those militants who have disarmed, like Lucky Man Aguila, say that it will take more than an amnesty to end the violence. Amnesty will not disarm the Niger Delta. 
it will only quell it for some time. It will bring peace for some time. And that peace will come to stay only if the government will be so kind enough to follow the processes that they've laid down to develop this Niger Delta. One of the most daunting promises that the government is making is to clean up the rivers themselves. All the river don't die. Creek everywhere don't die finish. Promised Dapa is a fisherman whose father always fed the family from the daily catch. But since oil production began, there's been a spill here equivalent to the Exxon Valdez disaster every year for 50 years. When Promise and his friend go out these days, this is often the result. Nothing. And the nets return covered in an oily film. Because of the spillage here and there, we know if we get fish to sustain, talk less of to sell. Help ourselves, help our children. No way, no way at all. The spill that caused this particular slick went on for three months, wreaking havoc on the ecosystem before Ajip Oil came in to clamp down a broken pipe. Oil producers are legally responsible for any spill, except if the pipe was sabotaged. The companies blame the majority of spills on sabotage, something that angers the locals. They hide under the cloak of uh, this is saying that uh, it is sabotage. That is why no effort has been made. Nobody has come to us for whatever reason, for by way of either compensation, relief materials, sending relief materials. They have not done nothing. They are nonchalant. They don't, they don't care. There is no denying that militants have routinely tapped into the oil pipes, selling off the oil to fund their campaign and causing more spills in the process. But even the Bielsa state governor believes that there are problems with the oil company's behavior. And I must say that the way the oil companies have operated so far in this area has been, you know, to say the least, irresponsible. Till now, the oil companies, including Shell, have stayed out of the amnesty dialogue refused to answer any allegations and wouldn't be interviewed for this story. Today, I'm traveling with a convoy of militants and the military to witness another disarmament. The Nigerian president's personal negotiator, Timi Alebe, is on hand to watch the ceremony. We assure the federal government that there will be peace in our region if the following conditions are met. One, practical development of the region. After demanding that new jobs be created and electricity and roads provided, the rebels surrender their arms. What you have done today, I'm sure will send a signal to all other youths who are presently carrying arms and ammunition to see this as an example and disarm fortress. And it seems they have. By the end of the amnesty period, just a few days ago, all of the biggest rebel generals have agreed to disarm. And the men leader and arms dealer, Henry Oka, has moved to South Africa. Before now, we always believed that the government is the whole problem. But now I think we understand that we also are part of the problem. And if we must solve the problem, 
We have to work together. The government insists it will keep its promises, but Nigeria's future is now on a knife's edge. If the government refused to develop the region and continue the marginalization and injustice, the use of the next people coming after us, I think, would be more brutal than what we have done.